Hey there, misfits. I'm Kate. And I'm Kale. Welcome to Horrorwood. We have waited to record this episode for a very long time. Listen, there's reasons, okay? I did have the walking pneumonia, um, but I got the antibiotics, and I am feeling mostly better. Uh, So, yeah, I have a chest x-ray coming up soon, and uh, we'll see how that goes. Anyway, we want to shout out... Our amazing friend who created that creeptastic music that you just heard, his name is Nick Davio. Shout out to Nick. Nick. We love you, Nick. Um, You're amazing. Nick is the kind of person or the kind of musician, I should say, that can literally play anything. If you're just like, oh, I just need some, um, some harmony here and like maybe some other instrument here. And he's like, okay, like this. And you're just like, what? And he has it seconds later. It's like, oh, yeah, this little thing? And we're like, what? Yes, that's the thing. I literally was like, hey, Nick, we're thinking of doing this um, this podcast. We'd like you to do some music for it. It's like creepy. And literally less than five minutes later, he messaged me back and he was like, how about this? And sends a link. And it's like this 40 second amazing clip. And I was like, wait, did you just come up with that and he was like oh yeah I just sat down at the piano this is what came out like I am so in awe of people that can do that it's phenomenal I have to back up because in college I thought it was Nick Davio and we always called him Nick Davio and then I ran into him at a theater here in Chicago a few years ago and he was just like we're just chatting and like sitting next to each other in the lobby and he's like so by the way, it's actually pronounced Davio. And my jaw was on the ground. I was like, what? I'm giving Katie a look right now because I just now learned this. Uh, so I'm going to go with Nick from now on. I literally pronounced his name wrong for years. And he just went with it. <laughs> so I'm like, okay. Um, and also, I think we should tell them that uh, when we were texting about him, Kaylee, uh, you accidentally... Well, not accidentally. I mean, it was an autocorrect, but it autocorrected Davio to Fabio. And so I feel like from now on, we should just refer to him as Fabio. And, you know, there was a lot of people who had crushes on him back in the day. So I feel like it fits anyway. Fabio or Davio? Davio. Well, both, actually. But I was I was thinking of our friend Nick. But (laughs) Um, so we want to just shout out Nick stuff. You should all go follow him on Instagram at Mr. Nick. Davio. That's N-I-C-K-D-A-V-I-O, as well as at Huron underscore coast, H-U-R-O-N underscore underscore coast. And his website is nicholasdavio.com. So check that out. We're going to link it all in the show notes. So you can just click on those little links there. And Kaylee, you have a shout out. I have a shout out to our very first follower. Hey. Hey. I was so excited for this. So I'm excited. My friend Laura, aka Larry, is what I call her. She calls me Bob. I don't even know where it came from, but anyway, that's our names. Um, she followed us and I I saw it pop up on uh, you know, my little notifications, and I was like, <gasps> oh my God, we have a follower. That's so exciting. We love you, Laura Larry, and we are so thankful that you are listening. So I said in part two, I was going to look up the origin of paparazzi because we were talking about that. But as I was researching it, I decided I think I want to do like a little mini-sode on that. So maybe we'll do it like on the Patreon or something. It's just a fun little thing. I like it. That said, let's dive right into it. All right. Marilyn Monroe. Here we go. So we ended part two with Marilyn's lifeless body being found nude on her bed. 
In one hand, she was holding the receiver of a phone off the hook, and on her nightstand were bottles of pills that included painkillers and sleeping pills. It's reported that there were also pill bottles scattered around the room, and her death was ruled a probable suicide. However, there are discrepancies in the timeline of events, as well as the accounts of the people who were supposedly there, which is why her death remains so mysterious to this day. Kaylee, are you okay? <laughs> there was, there's a fly all through, like, keep, land. <laughs> you look like you were having uh, a bit of an attack. You know what? The attack <laughs> is, is not knowing what actually happened to Marilyn Monroe. I think it also might be a fly. Um, <laughs> so I will say going into this, I thought I knew what happened. I fully believed not that she died by suicide, but that she accidentally OD'd. And same, and you, and I don't know if you saw the the um, Anna Delvey uh, Netflix uh, little docu series that was like, more, oh right, right, right. Yeah, it was kind of more of a drama, right? Um, and there was one episode where she kind of faked this whole scene, and it was very much like this, uh, but but it was all fake, right? And she went through the steps oh. of what it looked like, and it just, every time I hear what might have happened with Marilyn Monroe, I am thinking of this now, because we've been talking about her a lot, and so, of course, I've, like, done my own little research. I'm like, oh, it's time to go down the rabbit hole of Google, and it it's just very interesting how somebody later in life does this whole scene to get a, you know, to get away with something that Mm -hmm. I haven't watched that actually. I should watch that. Yeah. It's, it's just interesting to see how things unfold in various ways and different timeframes. Yeah. I, I will say I no longer think that she OD'd, um, accidentally. And at the end of this episode, I'll tell you what I think. So there are a few key figures involved in the account of her death her housekeeper, Eunice Murray, her psychiatrist, Dr. Ralph Greenson, the medical examiner, Dr. Thomas Noguchi, and interesting enough, enough your words, you'll hear his name in several episodes that we do because he uh, ended up becoming sort of the coroner to the stars. Very high profile Hollywood. Yes. Got it. Her friend, Peter Lawford, her frenemy and publicist, Patricia Pat. Newcomb, and perhaps most notably, President John F. Kennedy and Attorney General Robert Kennedy. These were not all the people that were at the scene of her death. These are just people that you're uncovering right now? No, these are just people involved in the account of her death. Just clarifying. Yeah. Now let's talk about those Kennedy boys. Bring it. (laughs) John F. Kennedy, who went by Jack, so I'm going to be referring to him as Jack, met Marilyn Monroe in the summer of 1954 at a party hosted by producer Charles Feldman. Jack was a senator at the time, and the meeting was arranged by Peter Lawford, who was a friend of Marilyn's and the brother-in-law to Jack and Bobby Kennedy. Peter was married to their sister, Pat. Peter was also a member of the Rat Pack with Frank Sinatra. Ah. Side note about Peter and Frank, prior to Peter marrying Pat Kennedy, the two had been friends but had a falling out, and Pat was the one who encouraged Peter to rekindle the friendship with Frank. And Frank was impressed with Peter's newfound ties to the Kennedys, and the two were once again friends. Look at that. Peter acted as a go-between for the Kennedys and women that he tried to set them up with. So basically, he said to Jack, hey, you've got to meet Marilyn Monroe. It was like a pimp. For lack of a better term. He was a presidential-like pimp. And uh, he's like, you got to meet Marilyn. I can make that happen. Charles Feldman is having this party. Marilyn didn't know that Peter was intentionally trying to get Jack Kennedy to meet her. So she attends the party with her then-husband, Joe DiMaggio. Marilyn told a friend afterwards that she felt uncomfortable at the party because Jack kept staring at her. And she said, quote, I may be flattering myself, but he couldn't take his eyes off me. Oh, I like it. Was she still wearing the sweater? I think she's moved on from the sweater at this point. Okay. (laughs) This was noticed by both Jackie Kennedy, because yes, JFK's wife was with Um. him at this party, and Joe DiMaggio. Joe did not like that Jack seemed interested in Marilyn, so he kept grabbing her arm every few minutes when say, let's go, I've had enough. 
Because remember, Joe was very possessive. So Right. I was going to say, we learned that before, that he does not care for all the attention that she gets. He does not. Now, Marilyn told a friend that she and Jack did not get together until after her divorce from Joe, which occurred just three months after this party. Jack and Marilyn would then see each other off and on for years. Peter was known for hosting a lot of scandalous parties at the home he shared with Pat, which was located at 625 Palisades Beach Road in Santa Monica, California. I'm going to post a picture of it on on Instagram. In attendance at these parties were celebrities, political figures, and even sex workers. Now, Jack and Marilyn were often in attendance at these parties, and JFK spent so much time at this house that it was nicknamed the Western White House. Can we go back to the house? And how? what's the affiliation? Is it Does Jack own the house? Peter Lawford he, owns the house. It's Peter's oh. house. Oh, oh. He lives Peter's there with house. his wife, Pat. Yeah. Got it. And Pat is the sister of Jack and Bobby. I was thinking it was strange that, you know, a president would own a house and on the beach side and the Palisades and Hollywood. But, you know, I you, mean, he spent know. a lot of time there. So got it. Now I'm going to go off on a bit of a tangent here, but I'm going to bring it back around. I promise. I just want to give some background. So Frank Sinatra was also a guest at these parties, and he's known to have also had a relationship with Marilyn. He also became good friends with Jack Kennedy. And Frank knew that being friends with the man who could potentially become the next president would bring a lot of benefits because it's good to have friends in high places. Frank's career was declining at the time, and he was looking to relaunch it. And it turns out being friends with a high profile political figure can really boost your celebrity. Look at that. Oh, so that's just what we need to do then. Yeah, we just got to find a president that we want to befriend but actually no i don't want to because it gets real it gets real muddy things get a little too spicy so frank began campaigning for jack to become president and put a lot of work into the election which included hosting fundraising dinners for him and making sure everyone he knew was aware was that a, he was a, good mm-hmm. friends with jack and that jack would be the next president He's just going around like, my buddy, my buddy Jack Kennedy, he's going to be president, yo, and I'm friends with him. And does everyone know that I'm friends with him? Because I'm friends with him. So during this time, Frank was uh, also friends with Chicago mob boss Sam Giancana. They were really close. Mm. And Frank introduced Sam to the election campaign in an effort to secure votes for Jack. Frank was briefly involved with a woman named Judith Exner at this time, and he introduced her to JFK. Then the two of them became involved. Are you with me? This is like the six, this is like the six degrees of Kevin Bacon. I am, I am trying to weave the strings together, but right now I have um, a very particular cobweb that I am caught in. So if anybody could get me out, that'd be great. I feel like, yes, Marilyn was also right there next to you in this cobweb because it was definitely a a web and it is wild. So I'm ready for the ride. I'm ready for the ride. All right. Because it is definitely a bumpy one. So buckle up. So Frank, again, is hooking up with Judith Exner. He introduced her to JFK. The two of them start hooking up. Then he introduces her to Sam Giancana. And then, yes, the two of them start hooking up. So Judith is now involved with Frank Sinatra, JFK, and Sam Giancana. I feel like it's like the uh, the the swingers of the beach side or something and in in the spider web. It is wild how everyone, I mean, literally everyone is sleeping with everyone. So there's that. JFK started using Judith to help arrange meetings between him and Sam because Jack felt he needed Sam's influence in order to win the election. Meanwhile, According to the book Handsome Johnny, a biography by author Lee Server about mobster Johnny Rosselli, who had close ties to both Sinatra and Giancana, Frank Sinatra allegedly began having an affair with Peter Lawford's wife, Pat, JFK's sister, in an effort to gain influence over the Kennedys. So just keep that all in your brain because it's all connected. Uh, The devil went down to Georgia or somewhere because this is getting... 
real good. It was at one of these parties at the Lawford House that Marilyn met Robert Kennedy. He went by Bobby. Bobby. The two began a relationship, and these parties were not discreet. The wives of these famous and powerful men would be in the next room while their husbands were just a few feet away doing whatever they wanted with whoever they wanted. You know, it's funny how history repeats itself because um, have you watched Warrior at all? No. What is that? Uh, it's it's a show on HBO, and um, I believe it was like a more of a Bruce Lee original. Like it's a it's a it's a remake of something maybe he wrote. I should look more into this, but it's kind of the same thing where the, it's basically these brothels um, in San Francisco in like late eighteen hundreds, early nineteen hundreds, and. People are just, you know, in the next room getting it on. It's kind of like Bridgerton, too. I mean, it was kind of like... I love Bridgerton. <laughs> I know. And, but but this is what happens, right? And it keeps repeating itself. And I know, like, you know, I live in the Bay, and there is an area here where it is Swinger Nation. Oh, wow. And and it's interesting because it is, you know, some high-profile people, and, and, and you just wouldn't think it. But it is what it is. Like, you know, it's a lifestyle, and if people want to do it, they, they're going to do it, right? It, and also, this is before the time of cell phones. So it's not like people were, you know, snapping a bunch of pictures necessarily. True, true. Bobby and Marilyn were seemingly really into each other. Marilyn would get all giggly when his name was brought up. And according to James Spada's biography of Peter Lawford, titled Peter Lawford, The Man Who Kept the Secrets, Bobby was backstage when Marilyn was getting ready to sing Happy Birthday to JFK and asked hairstylist Mickey Song to step out. So Bobby and Marilyn were in there for alone for about 15 minutes. And when Bobby came out, Marilyn was all disheveled and just giggled and asked Mix- Mixie, his name was Mickey, and asked Mickey to fix her up again. So the two were like a pair of teenagers infatuated with each other. And they did what most young teen lovers do. You know, they'd hold hands, go for walks along the beach, discuss the testing of atomic weapons and the possibility of nuclear war. <laughs> Young love, am I right? Because, right. <laughs> Both Kennedy brothers were very loose-lipped when it came to their conversations with Marilyn. Those boys liked to talk. Now, Marilyn was very liberal, and this was during the time of McCarthyism. Joseph McCarthy was a Republican senator who believed there were American citizens, particularly in the TV and film industry, who were communist and were a threat to the country. Marilyn was flagged by the FBI, oh. which was led by J. Edgar Hoover, because of her relationship with Arthur Miller. But the government thought Miller was a communist, and when her relationship with him began, they started keeping tabs on her. Those files are open to the public, and I'll link them in the show notes, because it's wild. This is incredible. I feel like everyone was drinking, like, the the classic, the Coca-Cola classic, and we're just high all day because this sounds absolutely insane. Do people get high on Coca-Cola classic? Well, no, you know that, you know, the, the myth or. Oh, I, myth. I, don't, I don't think it was a myth. I think that it really did have Coke. In it. I think it really was too before they knew. Right. So anyway, what I'm thinking, it's like they're drinking something because they, they sound absolutely just cracked out of their mind because who thinks that like Arthur Miller, a playwright or whatever, is a communist and and is wanted by the FBI. I mean, well, it was so. I mean, this was the Red Scare, and McCarthy and Hoover made it. They they really fanned the flames. But I mean, America was terrified, and it was the brink of nuclear war. But can you imagine if it was nowadays, and we have all the social media that we have, and just the threads that would be going out in this circumstance. You think about, I mean, look what Trump did. That's These, true. There are guys who are, and women, not just men, who know how to create fear in large groups of people. Wow. And that's what they were doing. Again, history repeating itself. Wow. So basically, Hoover and McCarthy thought that communists in the U.S. were acting as spies and giving secrets to the Soviet Union. World War II had just ended. Tensions between the U.S. and the Soviet Union were high. It was the Cold War, and the government was on high alert. At one point, while she and Bobby were having lunch at Peter Lawford's house, they discussed, quote, 
the morality of atomic testing. And there's an FBI file on Maryland regarding this matter, which is included in that FBI link I mentioned. Is this before the time of, of bugs, like planting a bug and some? Oh, no. Someone? They were bugging so her. They were. Okay. Yes. Oh, bugs are a big part of this episode. Okay. So there's an FBI file on Maryland regarding this matter, which is included in the FBI link I mentioned. And the FBI felt that the fact that she and Bobby had had this discussion about the atomic testing made her a security threat to the country. Wow. However, they never found any concrete evidence that she was a communist. And then after that lunch, Bobby went from the Lawford estate to Nevada to witness a nuclear weapons test. Oh, bad timing. This was during the same time that Fidel Castro asked the Soviet Union for military help in Cuba. Now, Marilyn associated with people who were considered communists, those people associated with Fidel Castro's people. The Kennedys began to realize, shit, probably shouldn't have said all that stuff about the nuclear weapons testing. So Bobby tells Marilyn, it's over. Don't ever call or contact me or my brother ever again. Yeah, he had to protect his position. And Marilyn was distraught. Now we're going to back up a little bit because we need to talk about Jimmy Hoffa. Bobby Kennedy and Jimmy Hoffa hated each other. Jimmy Hoffa was head of the Teamsters Union, and they were the toughest, most powerful labor union in the country. He was also very corrupt and had ties to the mob. And when it came to social class, he was on the opposite end of the spectrum as the Kennedys. Jack and Bobby Kennedy were spoiled rich kids uh. who were naive about how labor unions worked. They, they'd never been working class. But Bobby made it his mission to go after corruption in the labor unions and therefore try to bring down Hoffa. I love how corrupt people go after corrupt people. It's like my favorite pastime of of stories, right? You know, even though he was kind of fighting for the the good of the working class, like he's got ties to the mafia. They have ties to things that we don't even want to know about, right? And also, like, really, Bobby was, like, looking for his... um, like what his platform was going to be. He needed something that was all his because his brother is like a hot shot. And so he has decided to make it his mission to go after corruption in the labor unions. Got it. These two were thorns in each other's sides and their fight became very personal. They both made it their mission to bring the other down. Now Hoffa wanted to get as much dirt as he could on Jack and Bobby And he knew Peter Lawford's estate was the Kennedy playground. Uh And he also knew they were involved with Marilyn Monroe. So he hired private detective Fred Otash to have both Lawford's and Marilyn's homes bugged. Back to the beach. When the wires were installed, Fred noted that there were already surveillance bugs set up, meaning another entity was already monitoring these homes, presumably the FBI. It's also reported that both Peter and Marilyn found out their homes were bugged, and Marilyn even had her own surveillance wires installed as a means of protecting herself. She's such a little badass. Basically, should any questions arise about her and the Kennedy, she'd have her own proof of what happened. Smart. She also supposedly kept a diary where she recorded everything about her relationships with the Kennedy brothers. Because... She, again, she wrote everything down. And when she was with the Kennedys, the things that they would talk about, she liked to write down so that she could kind of go over it. And she always felt like, you know, she wanted to be seen as as very intelligent. Right. And so if there wasn't, if there was something she didn't understand, she wanted to learn more about it so that she could have, you know, these intellectual conversations with these powerful men. I mean, a a therapist would be proud of that fact to journal things down. So I feel like she was kind of ahead of her, you know, mental game at that point. Oh, she was all about the self-care, as we learned with With the the bathing. With the bathing. (laughs) Meanwhile, the FBI was bugging the phone lines of Sam Giancana because they were trying to crack down on mob activity. In 1960, the CIA hired Sam Giancana, along with Johnny Roselli, to kill Fidel Castro. The gangsters were more than willing and even offered to do it for free because they felt it would give them an in with the government and be sort of like a get out of jail free card. Both Jack and Bobby approved of this plot. This would be America's first confirmed attempt at state-sponsored assassination of a foreign leader. 
All of their attempts, however, would prove unsuccessful. Okay. So Giancana's phone is bugged. Frank Sinatra is friends with Giancana. A conversation was recorded between the two where Giancana is demanding Frank use his friendship with the Kennedys to take some heat off the mob. Frank replies that he's sleeping with the Kennedy sister, Pat, Peter Lawford's wife, in order to do just that. His exact words were, quote, I'll sleep with this goddamn bitch until I get something going. Was was he fibbing or was he serious? Because I was under the impression when you first introduced this to the story that that he liked her. That he liked Pat? The um the wife, yes. That he that he was having a, you know, an affair, an internal affair of like of of maybe love. But now it sounds like this is all just a ploy. Well, this is the first time I've mentioned that Frank and Pat were hooking up. You might be thinking of Judith because there are a lot of people sleeping with a lot of people and it's hard to keep it straight. God. Okay. I'm going, I'm, I'm going back down on the, uh, the web here. Yep. Yep. My eight legs. I'm, I'm on my fourth. So this is Pat Kennedy Lawford that is now sleeping with Frank Sinatra. Okay. And Frank is heard on the wiretaps that were planted by the FBI saying, I'll sleep with this goddamn bitch until I get something going. Now, J. Edgar Hoover was like, I have some info. And he runs to Bobby Kennedy and he's like, I've got something for you to hear and plays the tape for him. And just like that, Frank Sinatra was out of the Kennedy circle. Damn. Bobby sent Peter Lawford to tell Sinatra he was out, and Frank did not take the news well. And it effectively ended the friendship of Sinatra and Lawford, sort of a shoot the messenger situation. Right, right. So I know that was a complicated diversion in a sense, but I think it's important to know how all of these high profile, powerful men are connected to each other and to Marilyn. Basically, everyone was spying on everyone, everyone was sleeping with everyone, no one trusted each other, and the country was on the brink of a nuclear war. So it's all going great. Is it 2022? One might think. (laughs) This brings us to Marilyn's final days. Now, when Bobby Kennedy told Marilyn not to contact him or Jack again, this devastated her. And it also pissed her off. She felt like they'd just been using her, and she started calling the White House constantly, trying to talk to them. Wow, that's incredible that she was able to, you know, like she had that much um, advantage over being able to just pick up the phone and call the White House, right? And what's interesting about that is that she used to be able to just call them directly and all the calls started getting screened screened through Mm -hmm. their like secretary and they would never put her through. She specifically wanted Bobby to come to her and talk with her face to face because she didn't understand why the two of them couldn't be together. She thought he was going to leave his wife Ethel for her. She thought he was in love with her because these are things he told her. So why wouldn't she believe it? Of course. There are some sources that say she was even pregnant with a child and she wasn't sure if it was Jack or Bobby's. Wow. But that she thought it was probably Bobby's. And Bobby's? I don't know if I said his name. (laughs) Um, Bobby. Bobby. And supposedly, some sources say this. We it's not confirmed, but supposedly he forced her to get an abortion, which was illegal at the time. Mm. Look where we are. Look where we are. See, twenty twenty two. Bobby was scheduled to be in San Francisco at this time, and Marilyn threatened that if he didn't come to see her, she would spill all the tea. She said she was going to hold a press conference the following Monday, which would have been August 6th, 1962, and she was going to expose the affair, not to mention the pillow talk between her and the Kennedy brothers, like that whole CIA plot to kill Fidel Castro thing. Right. And she had, I mean, she she had all the evidence, really. I mean. Oh, she had all the evidence. Conversations recorded. Yeah. Her journal, everything. Now, if the affairs of the Kennedy brothers were exposed, it would have brought down the presidency. Well, it didn't necessarily for Clinton, but. At this time, I think it would have. Because, yeah, this is a different, yeah, this is a different era. This is definitely like, you know, kind of the Cleaver, right? The June Cleaver time frame. And these were so-called family men, and it it would have been a massive blow to their empire. 
And if Bobby Kennedy had indeed forced her to get an abortion, his career would be oh, over, over and he could yep. forget about ever becoming president. So when the Kennedys started ignoring her and refusing her calls, she was like, oh. all right, fuck around and find out. Yeah, she's such a savage. She was angry. She was hurt. And she started sharing her feelings with everyone, including Peter Lawford. Lawford called Bobby and said, uh, I think you need to get here down. Was that a sentence? I think you need to get here down. I think you need to get here <laughs> down. I was like, are we going back to the beach? Well, we are actually. He said, I think you need to get down here ASAP and talk to Marilyn. She is real spicy and real pissed. So Bobby came to L.A. and he and Peter went to Marilyn's house in the afternoon of Saturday, August 4th, 1962. Oh, I did not know this, and I know what that date is. There's a podcast called The Killing of Marilyn Monroe, hosted by Jackie Moran, and it's interesting. She uses a lot of audio clips from various people that go into what went down at Marilyn's house that day. So after you finish this episode, you should go check that out. It's There's some interesting stuff in there. We'll be doing that. According to Fred Otash, who had installed the surveillance tapes on behalf of Jimmy Hoffa, he said he heard both Peter and Bobby at Marilyn's house that afternoon. Otash stated that from the bug in the kitchen that he had planted, he heard Bobby tell Marilyn that he still loved her, but that things between them had to end because he had a family. Marilyn replied, quote, what do you think I am, a piece of meat? This is some great Gatsby shit. It kind of is, yeah. The fighting escalated and Otash said he heard Bobby ask, where is it? It's believed he was referring to her diary, which she wrote everything down about her relationships with the Kennedys. He asked, did you destroy it? To which she replied, hell no. The arguing became very heated, and I've seen in several sources that she then grabbed a kitchen knife and lunged at him, and Peter had to restrain her. Damn, girl. She's then heard on the tape bursting into tears. Just a few hours later, Marilyn would be dead. But what happened between the time she argued with Bobby to the time she died? The quote-unquote official story goes like this. Eunice Murray, Marilyn's housekeeper, who had been appointed to that position by Marilyn's psychoanalyst, Dr. Greenson. I I wish my doctor would appoint a housekeeper. (laughs) (laughs) Said that when she knocked on Marilyn's door around midnight the evening of August 4th, there was no answer and the door was locked. She found this odd, so she called Dr. Greenson. He came over. He peered through Marilyn's bedroom window from outside and saw that she appeared to be dead on the bed. So he broke the window to get into her room and check on her and then opened the door for Mrs. Murray and said, we've lost her. Oh. Then Dr. Greenson called the police at 425 a.m. That time is in police records. Sergeant Jack Clemens is the one who took the call and was the first official police officer on the scene. So did he wait four hours? I mean, he got there a little after midnight and now it's 425? Exactly. Hmm. That's weird. Eunice Murray realized it was weird too. So she changed her story. Said, you know what? My bad. My bad. Here's what really happened. Actually, I closed Marilyn's bedroom door at 8 p.m. and then went to bed. And then I woke up at 3 a.m. and Marilyn's light was still on, so I was concerned. And that's when I called Dr. Greenson. Yeah, that's it. Eunice, what are you drinking now? In one story, she can't get an answer from Marilyn. and the other, she was asleep, and it wasn't until hours later that she felt something was wrong because a light was on. In an interview years later, Murray said she, quote, found Marilyn's door ajar at about midnight. And then she stopped really quick and said, I mean, locked. I found the door locked. So... Needless to say, we can't put a lot of stock in Murray's account of what happened. And and they never found her guilty of anything. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming they got her story, but... No, she was never found guilty of anything. No one was because, uh, well, we'll get into it. Oh, it was... Right, right. Now, Dr. Thomas Noguchi was the medical examiner on this case. Already? That's weird. Because Noguchi was a junior medical examiner at the time. And in high-profile cases, which this certainly was, the chief medical examiner, Dr. Theodore Curfee, would conduct the autopsy himself. But Curfee passed it on to Noguchi. He was like, you know what? You, you take this one. And Noguchi said he never did understand why. He thought it was strange. 
By the time Noguchi got Marilyn's body, which was, was around 9 a.m. August 5th, she was already in an advanced state of rigor mortis. He noted the body had fixed lividity in the face, neck, chest, upper portions of arms, and right side of the abdomen. So when a person dies, blood stops pumping, obviously, and gravity pulls the blood to the lowest part of the body. That's lividity. So it makes sense she had fixed lividity on the front of her body because she was found lying face down. She was lying down. Mm -hmm. However, Noguchi also noted faint lividity in her back and the backs of her arms and legs. So there's dual lividity. And when that happens... So could that mean that somebody was turned? Well, kind of, yeah. It is a sign that the body was moved. Dr. Noguchi sent Marilyn's blood and organs off for toxicology tests, but only ordered the blood and liver be tested. A lethal dose of chloral hydrate, which is a sleep agent, was found in her blood, and a lethal dose of nembutal, another type of sleeping pill, was found in her liver. Noguchi prepared samples of her stomach, kidneys, and intestines, but um, weirdest thing, these samples disappeared. They disappeared. I knew it. This is unheard of. Like, that doesn't happen. John Minor, who was the Los Angeles County Deputy District Attorney at the time, and he was present at the autopsy, he said in the entire history of the L.A. County Coroner's Office, there had never been a previous instance of organ samples vanishing. Wow, that's that's really convenient. Noguchi listed her death as acute barbiturate poisoning, an overdose of sleeping pills. Overdose, right. And at a press conference later that day, his boss, Chief ME Dr. Theodore Curfee, stated her death was a probable suicide. Curfee, who wouldn't even go to the site, who wouldn't even examine her. Interesting. Probable is the interesting word here, because in an autopsy report, there are five reasons for death. Natural causes, homicide, suicide, accidental death, or undetermined. In this instance, it should have been undetermined right, because right. probable suggests they can't say with 100% certainty. So the wording is interesting here. Both John Minor and Noguchi's initial reactions were that this was not a suicide. Dr. Noguchi later said he made a mistake by not having all the organs tested. Right. And he was so bothered by this oversight that he went back to the lab a few weeks later, but her organs had been destroyed. So her organs were destroyed and those tissue samples that he had taken had been destroyed. So that's weird. Very suspicious. And my initial reaction is also that this has not been a suicide. Now, when Noguchi was examining Marilyn's body, he checked for signs of physical abuse as well as needle marks to determine if she had been injected with drugs. He did not find any. I did see in one source that her physician, Dr. Hyman Engelberg, had given her an injection the day prior when he visited her. There is a record of it. So if Noguchi missed that injection, it's possible he could have missed another. Or could it be something that was liquid, like in a drink? It's possible. And that theory has been floated around. Also, think about when you get a vaccine, you don't really see the mark. I mean, I, like my COVID vaccine, I, you, it doesn't look True. anything different than like a freckle. Right. Yeah. If it's even visible at all. So he did, however, discover a bruise just above her left hip. And judging by its color, he determined it was a fresh bruise. I'm going to read you what he wrote on the autopsy report under the external examination section. Oh. It is so cringeworthy, so just get ready. This is his way of of describing the body um, and notating the the bruise. And let's just remind everybody again, the body is Marilyn Monroe's body. So when we, we it sounds so formal when you're saying like he's going to describe the body under the examiner's notes, but 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 like this is Marilyn Monroe's body. Okay, sorry. It is. And listen to how he says it. The unembalmed body is that of a 36-year-old, well-developed, well-nourished Caucasian female. The scalp is covered with bleach blonde hair. A slight echemotic area is noted on the left hip and left side of lower back. A well-developed, well-nourished female? Like, what the fuck? It sounds like he's writing poetry right now. I'm like, this is an actual, like, coroner's report. I feel like I'm I'm reading, like, you know, y young Pablo or um, – what is what is that? Um, oh, I don't, it's some, you know, poetry writer and – One of those. One of those poetry writers. <laughs> um, 
Her blood contained no trace of alcohol. Oh. And you know what else he couldn't find a trace of? The sleeping pills. The sleeping pills I owe. But the amount of barbiturates in her system was well over the lethal lethal dose. We're talking 40, 50, 60 pills. There were no traces of pills in her stomach. All he found was what he described as a brown, milky substance, but there were no food particles or anything. Now, Dr. Noguchi would later say that this does not rule out the possibility that she swallowed such a large amount of pills. He stated that when a person is an addict, their stomach can digest the drug quickly because it is accustomed to the drug, and digestion would occur even faster if the drugs were taken on an empty stomach. As we learned in part one, she was not much of an eater, so... It is plausible that she hadn't eaten anything when the drugs entered her body. I'm just clarifying. Once they're digested, does it then it's smaller traces or do we not know that? So it's been debated okay, because some school of thought is that there would have been casings from the pills in her stomach um, or that the yellow dye that is typical on Nimbutol, which is what she took, would have been... uh, located in the stomach as well but then others come back and say well those pills were made so that the yellow dye would not run and with the amount of time that occurred between uh her death and when the autopsy happened the the content contents could have been digested so according to dr Deguchi, it is plausible that she could have taken that many pills orally but again it can't be confirmed So how else could the chloral hydrate and Nemutol get into her system? Let's go back to Saturday afternoon. She'd gotten into that heated fight with Bobby Kennedy, who was at her house with Peter Lawford. After Marilyn lunged at him with a knife, Bobby says she needs to be sedated. Now, this is where things get murky. Okay. Because there are a lot of different sources, and they often contradict each other. And the people who were there who have spoken about that night have changed their stories. We've already seen that with the housekeeper. I'm going to try to give a timeline of events in the best way I can based on the sources I used, which I think are most credible, and I'll link them in the show notes. Now, that afternoon, Marilyn's next-door neighbors saw Bobby exit the house, run to his car, where another man dressed in a suit was waiting, and the two of them went back inside together. The man in the suit was carrying a small black case. It is believed that Peter and Bobby then restrained her while this man injected her with a sedative, which could explain the bruise on her left hip, though I've also seen that this injection was in her armpit. While she is sedated, the search for her diary continues, and Bobby is heard on the wiretap screaming, Where the fuck is it? Where the fuck? Ooh. Peter places a call to Dr. Greenson and tells him he needs to come tend to Marilyn. Bobby allegedly tells Dr. Greenson that Marilyn is threatening to tell all and says, quote, we're all in this dung heap now. Shit. This would be alarming to Greenson because, as it turns out, he was also sleeping with Marilyn. Damn! And if anyone were to find out, he would lose his family and most definitely his career. As Marilyn starts to come to, she gets pissed that these guys are going through her things and starts screaming for them to get out, so they leave. Is the housekeeper, is someone there that accounted for this? Like, how do we know this? So this is what Fred Otash states he heard on the wiretaps. Got it. And there's 11 hours of, um, not footage, but uh, 11 hours of tape from these bugs. Recordings, okay. Okay. That several people have said they listened to and have given accounts of what they heard. Okay. Um, So there's that. Now, Dr. Greenson arrives around 3 p.m. that afternoon. It is unclear if he gave her any type of drug to calm her down or if he just spoke with her. I couldn't find any evidence of anything. Okay. At 5 p.m., Peter Lawford called Marilyn to invite her to a dinner party at his house. It was the traditional Saturday Saturday night thing that they did. And I think it was kind of his way of trying to be like, hey, it's all good. Like, move things over. Sorry about all that earlier. Just come to the come to our party. So she wasn't super excited about it, but she was like, yeah, sure, I guess. After she doesn't arrive, Peter calls again at seven asking her if she's coming. And she says no, because she's tired. As soon as that call ends, she gets a call from Joe DiMaggio Jr., who is the son of her ex-husband. 
He calls to tell her that he's broken off his engagement with his girlfriend. And Marilyn was thrilled. She said she was so happy for him because apparently she didn't like the girl and she thought Joe Jr. was too young to get married. Oh, okay. Okay. At least she got some good news before her death. Yeah, she was very excited about this. Joe DiMaggio confirms this call between his ex-wife and his son, saying it lasted about 15 minutes and that Marilyn seemed, quote, quite normal and in good spirits. And this is before the door is shut and locked. Correct. This is at 7 p.m. Marilyn relays the good news to Dr. Greenson uh, about Joe Jr. And she thanks him for coming over and spending time with her. And she's like, you know what? I'm feeling much better. I feel a lot calmer now. And Dr. Greenson was like, cool beans. I'm out. I'm going to a friend's house for dinner. And he leaves. At 7.30 p.m., Peter Lawford calls Marilyn once again, asking her to come to his damn party. Now, this is where the famous goodbye speech comes into play. Peter stated that Marin's, Marilyn's last words to him were, quote, say goodbye to Pat, meaning Peter's wife, say goodbye to Jack, and say goodbye to yourself because you're a nice guy. Right. But interestingly enough, Fred Otash, who had wiretaps set up in both Peter and Marilyn's homes, said that's not what he heard. He said Marilyn's response to Peter asking her to come over was, no, I'm tired. There's nothing more for me to respond to. Just do me a favor. Tell the president I tried to get him. Tell him goodbye for me. I think my purpose has been served. Oh. To me, when she says there is nothing for, more for me to respond to, I think she assumes, and probably correctly, that Bobby was at Peter's and she didn't want to get into another argument with him. Mm -hmm. And I think when she says, tell the president I tried to get him, tell him goodbye for me. I think she's just saying, yeah, I tried to call the president out and right. reveal his shit, but I'm done. My purpose has been served. Sounds either like I made my point or it's her saying like she's done being their play thing. It's over. That's what I think. Mm -hmm. Then the next few hours, a lethal amount of drugs would enter her body, killing her. So I'm going to now walk through the theories of how they got there. There's the suicide theory. She was upset about Bobby and feeling depressed and swallowed a lethal amount of pills. I don't buy it. I do not think she died no. by suicide. Yeah. She was found with several pill bottles on her nightstand and around her bedroom. But one interesting observation to note is that all the pill bottles were neatly capped. If she were in a state where she's taking different pills from various bottles, ready to end it all... Would she have neatly capped all the bottles? I don't think so. How, how could she? She couldn't do that. Also, there was no suicide note. Now, she had reportedly left a note in her previous suicide attempts. And given how much writing she did, I mean, she wrote everything down. She was going to write a note if she was going to do this herself. That's what I think. That's so clear to me. And in her previous attempts, there was vomit and undigested pills. But her autopsy indicated none of that was president. But president? Oh, my God. That was a Freudian slip. Well, I got it on the brain. <laughs> indicated that there was no vomit or undigested pills present. Also, and this to me is the thing that really stands out. There was no drinking glass found in the room. Uh, she didn't. No. Pretty sure she didn't just work up a bunch of saliva to swallow 60 pills. I can barely do that for one. There's no way that she. Yeah. Yeah. So I, this theory is wrong. I'm not buying that it was a suicide. The next theory is that she accidentally OD'd. It's plausible. She was upset. She was trying to calm down and relax. Maybe she just took a few too many. Things don't line up though. Where's the glass? Exactly. I mean, it's kind of the same ordeal, right? Because for a while, yeah, I thought this was likely what happened. And I was like, perhaps she took too much and no one revived her. Either they couldn't or they wouldn't. But yeah, then I think about the lack of a drinking glass and the pill bottles neatly capped. So I don't think that's what happened. Theory three is that the CIA or FBI ordered her to be killed because she knew too much. This too is plausible. She knew a lot of government secrets and the FBI had her under surveillance. Plus, if the government was willing to take out a foreign leader, who's to say they wouldn't off a movie star because of her ties to the Kennedys, as well as her involvement with people that were suspected of being communist? So I could see this being a thing. I definitely could see this being more of a thing than the first two. And I, I also think that trouble plays with trouble. So, you know, they knew that she 
had a lot of um, she ha- she had a lot against them, right? And she and and something had already happened um, where there was kind of uh, the ties that were broken, right? And I think that at this point they had some they needed some protection. So this theory is I'm going to give it like a you know a little star. Yeah, it's plausible. Theory four is that Jimmy Hoffa and the mafia were behind her death as a way for Hoffa to get to Bobby Kennedy. Now, although I believe Hoffa could have put a hit out on her if he wanted, I don't think he wanted to. Right. He was using her. He had her place bugged to get dirt on the Kennedys. She was useful to him, so I don't think he would have her killed. No, and I, fe- and I feel like somebody in that position actually w- would just go after the person they're going after. That is exactly my next comment. Like, if he was going to do it, I don't think he would have done it via drugs in this, like, oh crazy way. I think he would have just had someone come over and shoot her, to put it bluntly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Eh. Now, mix this one too. the final theory, Bobby Kennedy had her killed. I got to say, I, this is plausible. Mm-hmm. Now, a lot of the information I got that supports this theory comes from the book Marilyn Monroe, A Case for Murder by Jay Margolis, which I'll link. In it, he cites several sources and interviews to corroborate, corroborate the information. And I have to say, he makes a compelling case. Here's what I want to say about just what I believe in this time era that the Kennedys were like, like they didn't want to get their hands dirty. Right. And so they're, Oh, of course not. They're not going to use something, you know, like a knife or even a gun because that creates more evidence, right? They're going to do something that's a lot easier to, um, pin on something else, pills, something that's not going to leave much of a trace. They're going to do something that's not going to leave a mess because they don't like getting their hands dirty. I mean, they go to Martha's Vineyards and wear very crisp, clean linen. I love that that's your, that's your, your, uh, what's, what, not the, not the line. What's the word I'm thinking of? Um, it's like, that's the reason they wear linen. So there's not going to be, they weren't going to use a weapon. <laughs> well, and like, you know, when you, when you see all the old pictures, right, you see them and they're, they're just clean cut, crisp people and clean cut, crisp. They play dirty, but, but they don't get dirty. Okay. But they wear linen. They, they wear linen. <laughs> linen. <laughs> You sounded like you were from Kentucky for a second. I could say that because I am from Kentucky. They were landing. I don't know what just happened. I don't know what just happened. I was getting really like worked up about this. Oh, and I was amazing. thinking to myself, you know, they, they weren't in the working class. So with Hoffa, I'm thinking like exactly. if he were going to do it, he's going to, he's just going to, he's just going to do it. Right. He's not even going to think about like, oh, let me do some injections because, or let me have some kind of pills be like, or or liquid in her drink. It's just not going to happen. Whereas if it's, if it's with the Kennedys, it has to be strategic, right? And they had to put a lot of thought into it and they had to figure out the easiest way to get this to happen without having much trace or evidence. Well, I don't even think that they put a lot of thought into it. If in fact, this is what happened. I think, um, well, let me, I'm going to lay out the remaining timeline for the evening um, based on what Jay Margolis gathered for his book. So Norman Jeffries, who was Eunice Murray's son-in-law, and he was also a handyman working on Marilyn's home that day, stated that Bobby Kennedy, along with two security officers, arrived back at Marilyn's that evening between 9.30 and 9.45 p.m. They instructed Norman and Eunice to leave, but those two didn't go far. They just kind of went right next door. Bobby and his men then entered the guest cottage, presumably to search for the diary. They broke into Marilyn's filing cabinet, which ended up making a lot of noise. At 9.45 p.m., Marilyn, who was on the phone with her friend Jose Bolaños at the time, asked him to hold on a minute. And she said, yo, there's a lot of noise out back. Let me go check this out. Bolaño said she never returned to the phone. Marilyn goes to the guest cottage and sees Bobby and his men going through her stuff, and she starts screaming at them. 
on the wiretaps, which this has been corroborated in multiple sources, one of the three men covered her face with a pillow while another made an enema of chloral hydrate and nimbutol. I read in one source it was Bobby who held the pillow over her face, but I couldn't find that confirmed anywhere, so I don't know if that's what happened. Regardless, though, I do think if this scenario did happen, it would take three men. One to hold the pillow on her face, one to restrain her. And then one to put the enema. Exactly. In the place it needs to go. She already had the supplies needed for an enema because she did take those from time to time. So it's plausible that they were easily able to create and administer one. It's presumed. I don't want to go. I don't want to die that way. Oh, my God. Well, I mean, who does? Right. But wow. It's presumed she did not walk into the guest's cottage naked. So if these events occurred, the men would have had to strip her before administering the enema. And when I first read this, I was like, how could they do that? Because she'd be fighting like hell. But then I read in another source um, that she, and I think this was information given by Eunice, that, you know, she was in for the night. She was just wearing her white terry cloth robe, which would make sense because she was just chilling in her room. She wasn't planning to go to that party. She's talking on the phone. And that robe was her go-to. We learned that in the previous episode. Right. And how do we know not know that um, maybe she took, you know, if she had a nightly routine of taking like a sleeping pill, maybe she was relaxed. I mean, maybe she didn't, you know, you kind of like relaxes you and calms you. Maybe she didn't have it in her to like fight a heavy fight that could be heard. Through yeah. And I don't know that right? she would have taken a pill at that point. She had already been injected. Um Earlier, oh. remember. So right, right. it's possible that, yeah, she was just kind of chilling out um, from that. But regardless, like, I could see that if she was just wearing the robe, they could easily slip that off of her. Now, at 10 o'clock p.m., Marilyn attempts to make a call in the guest cottage, but the person doesn't answer and she goes unconscious. Bobby continues searching for the diary for the next 30 minutes. Between 10.20 and 10.25... Someone, it's never confirmed to, but I think we all have an idea, calls Peter Lawford and tells him to get to Maryland's and orders him to hire a professional to remove any link between Maryland and the Kennedys. Wow. Peter then calls Fred Otash. Now, remember, Fred Otash had bugged Peter's place. Right. And this is what's wild because Otash's name comes up in other cases. Like, everyone used this guy. <laughs> fascinating to spy on everyone else so peter calls to fred and tells him to meet him at maryland so peter had to end his dinner party a little early huh yes i question the whole dinner party situation i wonder if he was trying to sway her to get over there so that they could do this all in the vicinity of where they were see i don't know and because i couldn't get a lot of information corroborated about this dinner party it again it is murky guys like mm. it's a lot. So I, I'm i not really, I'm not going into the dinner party at all. I'm just giving the account of what, based on what was heard on these wiretapes at Marilyn's house. So according to Norman Jeffries, at 10.30 p.m., Bobby and his security officers, officers exit. Norman and Eunice then hear Marilyn's dog barking in the guest cottage. So they walk over to see Marilyn. Because remember, they are just, they did not go far. So they're kind of keeping an eye on everything that's going on. They walk over to see Marilyn face down and leaning on a phone. She was still alive at this point, but just barely. Oh. Eunice uses the phone to call an ambulance and Dr. Greenson, who tells her to call Dr. Mm -hmm. Engelberg. And although Dr. Engelberg, that was her physician, remember, is placed at the scene by a number of sources, I can't really figure out what his role was that evening, other than he too stated that her death was a suicide. According to Norman, shortly after Eunice placed these calls, Peter Lawford arrived with Patricia, or Pat Newcomb. Pat Newcomb was Marilyn's publicist and so-called friend. She worked in the office of Arthur Jacobs, who was Marilyn's PR agent. Side note, Marilyn suspected that Pat was also sleeping with Bobby. So there's that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. According to Norman... Pat started screaming at Eunice, blaming her for Marilyn's current state. Norman then escorted his mother-in-law into the main house. Eunice then went into Marilyn's bedroom, 
grabbed the diary, knowing right where it was kept, as well as an address book, and put them in her purse. Fred arrives, and he and Peter go into the guest cottage, strip the bed, and use the sheets to clean up Marilyn from the enema, because enemas leak. Mm -hmm. They then place Marilyn back on the bed, face up, and give the soiled sheets to Eunice and tell her to wash them. So this is why earlier in the coroner's report, we know that she had been moved or that she had been turned in the way that the blood had ran. Remember, though, she's still alive mm -hmm. at this point. So there wouldn't be lividity yet. Oh, yet. She's okay. just barely alive. So they give the sheets to Eunice and tell her to go wash them. Pat Newcomb then calls the Hollywood Bowl where Arthur Jacobs was attending a Henry Mancini concert and has them give Arthur a message to get to Maryland's right away. Arthur Jacobs arrives about 11 p.m. The ambulance arrives right around the same time. James Hall was the ambulance attendant. He was 22 years old at the time and identified the first person he saw as Pat Newcomb. She was screaming, she's dead, she's dead, I think she's dead, I think she took some pills. Hall noted that he found Marilyn lying face up with no blanket or sheet underneath her. He smelled her breath and noted that he did not detect the scent of pear, which when chloral hydrate is taken orally, there is a distinct pear smell that it leaves. Sometime between 11 o'clock and 11.30, Hall, along with ambulance driver Murray Leibowitz, moved Marilyn to the floor because they needed a hard surface to perform CPR. And he said when they did this, he dropped her. And that's how she got the bruise on her left side. He said she was alive. Dead bodies don't bruise. Oh. Hall then inserted an airway down Marilyn's throat and attached a resuscitator while giving her external heart massage. She began getting more color and was showing improvement. What? This is when Hall states that a man he would later identify as Dr. Greenson came in and took over. Greenson was like, thanks, kid. Got it from here and ordered that Hall remove the airway. Now, I'm going to read you a statement given by Hall about what happened next. Hall states, this was the wrong thing to do, but I was in no position to argue he was supposedly a physician. I was just a 22-year-old ambulance attendant who had been told time and time again by his superiors, never argue with an MD. All he had to do was report me and I was out of a job. My wife was pregnant, so I kept my mouth shut. He pushed me aside, reached into his medical bag, pulled out a syringe with a long heart needle, filled it with a brownish liquid, and injected it into Miss Monroe's heart. Immediately, Miss Monroe started to lose her color again. Then he announced, I'm pronouncing her dead. You can go now. I couldn't believe it. Maybe I shouldn't second guess the guy, but I'm sure if I had gotten her to the hospital, Miss Monroe would be alive today. Just as we were packing up our equipment, two men dressed as police officers arrived. They didn't ask us any questions, which I thought was strange. Okay. So... It is believed that Bobby Kennedy assumed she would die from the enema, but hadn't planned on the ambulance arriving. So then he ordered Dr. Greenson to intervene and give her the fatal shot. And I think Greenson, Peter, everyone was enamored by the Kennedys and also fearful of them. So I think they were willing to do whatever Bobby asked. And inside that shot, that brownish liquid was um, basically a, liquid, a liquefied form of Nembutal which is what they found in her system. James Hall was given several polygraph tests. He passed all of them with flying colors. He also went under forensic hypnosis, and his account under hypnosis aligned perfectly with the statement he'd given. Now, between 1145 and 1150, Marilyn's neighbor, Abe Landau, and his wife returned home after an evening out and noted several vehicles parked along the street. A limousine, a police car, an ambulance, and a sedan. Well, we know what Bobby was riding in. Yes. And the police car is important because, remember, the police weren't called until 4.25 a.m. Right. And this neighbor arrived home around 11.45, 11.50. The police car belonged to Sergeant Marvin Iannone. I might be saying that wrong. He was Bobby Kennedy's sort of personal police officer. 
He is the officer who signed the slip for the ambulance attendants so they could get paid. After James Hall and his partner left, it is believed that those at the house staged the scene to make it look like a suicide. They moved Marilyn's body to the bedroom. So that would have been when the faint lividity happened was when she died on the floor. And then they moved her. And then when they moved the body to the bedroom, they placed her face down. To make it look like she went to go to sleep. Well, it's believed that they placed her face down so that fixed lividity could disguise the needle mark Dr. Greenson had left. The bottles of pills were placed around her room. At 12.10 a.m., near the intersection of Robertson and Olympic Boulevards, Officer Lynn Franklin pulls over a Lincoln Continental sedan with its headlights off, going 80 miles per hour. Damn. Peter Lawford was driving. Dr. Greenson was in the passenger seat, and though the officer didn't know who he was at the time, he was able to identify him later. And Bobby Kennedy was in the back seat. Officer Franklin didn't want to give a ticket because... This was the attorney general, so he just sent them on their way. Right. Now, sometime between 1230 and 2 a.m., Bobby takes a helicopter from Peter Lawford's house to LAX, where he then flew to San Francisco. There is a flight log that confirms this. And neighbors of Lawford were interviewed separately, and they all gave the same story, that a helicopter landed on the beach, which was legal back then. And this particular helicopter was one that both Lawford and Sinatra often chartered. Used. Exactly. So this wasn't a new thing. Um, So the helicopter landed on the beach. It was loud. It blew sand everywhere. One guy was like, yeah, my pool had all this sand and debris in it. Ugh, because rich people. Greenson then goes back to Marilyn's house. It is (laughs) unclear how he got there since he'd been riding in Peter's car. I couldn't find anything saying that Peter went back. So I'm not I'm not sure about that. But just the doctor. Okay. Yeah. I mean, possibly Peter did, but I, I'm unclear on that. I and mean, I couldn't find anything that really like said either way. At 425 a.m., Dr. Greenson calls the police. Sergeant Jack Clemens answers the call, and Dr. Greenson says he wants to quote, report the death of a person, a sudden and unexplained death. Which is just like a weird thing to say. Hmm. A sudden and unexplained death. So upon arrival... But this is already after the two cops had appeared at 1125. Oh, yeah. And yeah. The ambulance yep. and all of that. Okay. This is hours later. Upon arrival, Officer Clemens said he immediately felt like the scene had been staged. He thought it was weird that she was lying face down in a soldier's position, just perfectly straight. And he noted that the pill bottles were all neatly capped. And for a suicide, that would be weird. He also thought it was weird that the housekeeper was doing laundry. Oh, she was washing those enema sheets. He was like, uh, your employer just died. You maybe want to put down the detergent. I don't know. This is when Eunice and Dr. Greenson gave their statements about when they found her, when the doctor came over and all that, which just didn't add up. And the doctor hired her. Exactly. So she's, I mean, she's going to say whatever Greenson tells her she needs to say. Exactly. At 5.30 a.m., Sergeant Marvin Iannone dismissed Clemens from the scene. He's like, you can go. Meanwhile, Pat Newcomb is still at the house and she is frantically looking for something. She's going through all the drawers and stuff. Police had to kick her out because they were trying to seal off the scene and she just did not want to leave. Hmm. At 5.45 a.m., employees from the mortuary show up to take away Marilyn's body. Not the coroner. The mortuary where she was to be embalmed. Like, what? That seems pretty fast. She hadn't been examined yet or anything, and no one knows who made the call to the mortuary. And who called? I was going to say, who made the call exactly? They don't know. Dr. Noguchi had to wait to do the opsop the opsopsy? <laughs> the opsopsy. Words are hard. You know what? It's late. Yeah, they're real hard. Uh, had to wait to do the autopsy because he didn't have the body. And by the time he got it, he said that based on the advanced state of rigor mortis, he placed her time of death somewhere around midnight, which would add up. There is an autopsy photo. I'm not going to post it because I know some people don't want to see that kind of thing. If you do, it is pretty easy to find online. And there are some who believe it is not her in the photo. And there are conspiracy theorists who think either something was done with her body or that she didn't even actually die. I've looked at this photo. 
it is her. I have no doubt because I've seen other photos of her where she's not wearing a lot of makeup and her hair isn't perfectly done. And I'm like, yeah, that's her. And was her body cremated? Because I know Hugh Hefner bought his headstone next to her. So is that, is there a body in there? Do we her, know anything more about that? Her body was not cremated. Okay. Now this is really sad. Initially, no one claimed her body. She didn't have any family. None of her friends came forward. And upon learning of her death, Joe DiMaggio flew from New York to L.A. and claimed her body. He arranged her funeral. He covered all of the expenses. And he was very particular about who could and could not come. He only invited around 30 people. And he refused to let the Lawfords or any of her so-called friends attend. I think it's safe to say the Kennedys weren't there. Oh, no, they were not there. Um, because Joe felt that all of those people had played a part in her death and he did not want them at their at her funeral. Now, Morris Engelberg, who was Joe DiMaggio's lawyer and friend, was at his bedside when Joe died in 1999. And he said Joe's last words were, quote, I'll finally get to see Marilyn. Oh, wow. I just got the chills. Now, I mean, it's weird because he did seem to... <laughs> take care of her you know he was the one who moved her out of that right. psychiatric clinic he right he it's like he did some good he had some love for her but, but it was a twisted kind of love yeah that's the thing it was just like ugh. arthur miller did not attend her funeral but he never got over her his relationship with Marilyn was reflected in his writing with after the fall which was considered by many to be largely auto autobiographical mm -hmm. And finishing the picture, which was about the making of the misfits. No criminal investigation was ever launched in the death of Marilyn Monroe. What? That is wild. The main people involved that fateful night never questioned by authorities. All the evidence that could have helped determine what exactly happened that night, oddly, it all disappeared. How much money do you think that all of these people made? You know, because clearly they're getting paid off. Oh, yeah. I mean, if this happened, allegedly, Kennedys don't come at me. I don't know. <laughs> the phone records, gone. The wiretaps, gone. Organs. Her organs and tissue samples, discarded. And the diary? Not to be found. Norman Jeffries said he saw Eunice hand over the diary and address book to the coroner's office, and it mysteriously mm. disappeared. Now, I don't know if that is what happened, but needless to say, the diary was never found. They need to check her purse. The thing is, because I was thinking about this, I mean, she worked for Dr. Greenson. If Greenson told her, right. oh, you should send it to the coroner's office, and then they, I mean, because clearly people were in cahoots with, because her organs disappeared. So someone at the coroner's office, you know, was working for someone was also part of this yeah yeah I don't, oh, it's just a lot now pat newcomb she claims she was never at maryland's that night what despite multiple people identifying her at the scene she was just like no it wasn't me immediately after maryland's death pat newcomb and eunice murray suddenly went away to europe for months on extended vacations oh did they know years later when Pat was asked if the Kennedys sent her away, her response was, well, I was going anyway. Um, uh, what? Well, that confirms everything. Okay. When she returned to the U.S., get this, she was hired as an information specialist in the United States Information Agency, as well as a consultant to the Justice Department. And she worked on Bobby Kennedy's senatorial campaign in 1964 and was his campaign manager in the 1968 presidential election. Well, how convenient. This has some catch me if you can vibes to it. It's wild. <sighs> Marvin Iannone, Kennedy's personal cop. Oh, he got promoted to becoming the first assistant chief of police for the LAPD. Bobby Kennedy. Yeah, he said he was never even in L.A. that night. It was so weird. Because he was wearing his white linen somewhere. He was wearing his linen somewhere. <laughs> Peter Lawford, when asked about it, was like, yeah, no, Bobby wasn't here. I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. He was never, he was, I haven't seen him. He missed the dinner party. <laughs> yeah, he, yeah, he was like, I was just at my dinner party. I don't know. A reporter that was on the scene that Sunday morning got word back to Lawford that Bobby had been identified as being at Maryland's and he was going to run the story. And word came back saying that Bobby Kennedy would appreciate it if he didn't. 
and the story didn't run. Dr. Greenson was a clinical professor of psychiatry at UCLA and served on the Board on Professional Standards. He published 53 papers in psychoanalytic journals, and he kept boxes of records on Marilyn Monroe at the UCLA library that are available to the public, except for one, which is to remain sealed until January 1st, 2039. So I guess we'll have to wait 16 and a half years before we learn the truth. So what are your thoughts? What do you think happened? Oh. Like, which well, th- which theory do you believe? Theory five. You think she was murdered? Yeah, I definitely think that there was some sort of a homicide. I definitely think that there was lots of hiding. There was so many signs that point to the fact that, one, I just don't think that she did any kind of accidental um, I don't either. Drug overdose. I don't believe I I don't believe that she committed suicide even with her attempts. Um I feel like she did let go of some things through that speech, but I I don't think that she let go of it in a way that she was letting herself go. Her I think she was like I'm just turning over a new leaf. Um she was such a strong person that I I don't believe that she wanted this you know, for herself. I think she was ready to move forward and, and, and start fresh in whatever capacity that was. And that's, and not a death capacity, right? Yeah. And I mean, reports say like all, like her friends all said she was really hopeful for things and she was in good spirits and she was working on new projects that were coming up and, and had all these plans. And she was trying to start like another independent production company. And I mean, the woman had you know, goals. And I just, yeah, it's, it's just a little, there's too many, too, there's too many sketchy, um, you know, I agree like strings here with, with the, the big spider on the wall, um, mm-hmm. that I, that web that I will name Kennedy now. Um, may, may they <laughs> rest, but, um, it, allegedly it, Kennedy, it's okay. We're don't come at us. We're just podcast. Well, yeah. We're we're just going through some theories, but it just seems like there is something that's obvious but missing. So I read recently where people were asking, why does anyone still care about this? And I thought, if your loved one died under mysterious circumstances, wouldn't you want to get to the bottom of it? And if she was murdered and the government had something to do with it, like that's something people should know about. Right. And there, there are many, many people out there that will spend their lifetime trying to figure out what happened to a loved one. Oh, yeah. I mean, this just happened with the Brian Landry case. Like, if they had not come to a conclusion with that, that family for Gabby would have spent their lifetime, and any family would. They would want to know what happened because that's how – you, you're never going to get closure from a death of a loved one, but that's how you're going to be able to kind of go to bed at night is finally knowing or or having that uh, mystery solved, right? Like knowing that you have all the facts there of what happened. That's that's usually how people are able to con- continue on, right? And I I do think, I mean, I do think Bobby ordered it. Allegedly. Um, but we want to know what you think. So maybe when the episode posts, we'll do a poll on Instagram, maybe? Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Do you think it was suicide, an accident, or murder? Um, we'll leave you with a couple of quotes from Marilyn. Imperfection is, I'm going to start that again because I couldn't even say the word imperfection. Imperfection is beauty. Madness is genius. And it's better to be absolutely ridiculous than absolutely boring. And the last one is, most importantly, keep smiling because life is a beautiful thing and there's so much to smile about. That's so beautiful. So let us know what you think. You can check us out on Instagram at Horrorwood Podcast. Uh, Check us out on Facebook at Horrorwood Podcast. And I did just make a Facebook group called the Horrorwood Misfits. Um, Tweet at us at Horrorwood Pod. And drop us an email at horrorwoodpodcast at gmail.com. Is that all of them? Are those all the social media things? 
books <laughs> and I didn't even know we had half of those. So uh, we're all learning here. Um, yes, I think that's all of them. And if we have more, we'll shout them out at the next episode. And I'm going to link all the sources um, so you can read these things for yourself and draw your own conclusions. Because again, it's unsolved and it probably will remain so um, until maybe 2039. I was going to we'll say, I was going to say in 2039, we'll have a like kind of a reunion episode on this. And I mean, that would be hilarious if we are still doing this podcast in 2039. I would kind of love it. I feel like by then, like podcasts will be gone and there's going to be some other new like medium that people use on that note fare thee well mafia honey now my little palette cleanser for this episode Mm -hmm. is i've said mafia honey and a couple of the and well i think all three of these um these episodes on marilyn monroe since we had some continuations mafia honey is actually a maltese terrier Yes, yes. That American singer Frank Sinatra gifted Marilyn. Um, and then after she passed away, the dog uh, was given to Frank Sinatra's secretary. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, and she called him Moff. And Moff is the dog that yeah. was there in the guest cottage when she died. I feel like I need to get a dog. And <laughs> I want a dog so bad. We are, oh my God, you don't even understand. Well, you do. We're, we're trying. I do, I do. We're trying. I do think that the name Mafia Honey is badass, but I've, I've already named my future dog and it's going to be Tater Tot Duke Silver. So <laughs> I'll call him Tate for short. Um, but but if I were to get another dog, I think it would be like MH Baby, Mafia Honey. I, Moff. I have mixed feelings about it just because Frank Sinatra was a dick. Right. And her involvement with that whole group led to her death. And I think also I read that she, um, I feel like she initially did not want that dog. There was something about it. I don't remember it now, but um, there were like issues about that dog. And yeah, it just. Well, and she has the PTSD from the the, the dog that was killed in front of her. I mean, so, yeah, it just, whew, what a life. Mare, Marilyn. We love you. If you're if you're out there and you want to give us a sign, um, or you know a sixth sense, a six. That's really fucking hard to say. Sixth sense. Six words sixth, are so hard. That is hard. Sixth sense. Well, how do you even say S I X T H? Sixth, right? Six. Yeah. Sixth <laughs> sense. Wow. You know what? Also, just again, let's just remind all of these misfits out there that the podcast is named a word that I can't hardly even say that I've practiced in the front of the mirror so many times. It's okay. Um, so it's part of the, it's part of the fun. Anyway, Marilyn, listen, if you could just give us some kind of a sign or kind of show us how you, you died like on that movie, uh, that'd be great. Then we'll, we'll, we'll make sure that we, um, come back to this. We love so. you, Marilyn. And we love all of you. We do. We do. We're all just little misfits. <laughs> all right. Bye. <laughs>